Thanks, Nick. Thank you to our wonderful worship team. A great blessing. Before I start, uh, Colin's just reminded me of something very important. The members meeting next Sunday, it is a members meeting, but anyone is able to come. That's actually really important to me, um, that non-members as well are welcome to come to hear about what's happening, about what we're planning to do. Uh, transparency is important. I've, we've got nothing to hide here, so you are very welcome to come um, and even ask questions, any of that stuff. The only thing you can't do is vote. The rules say you can't do that. Um, but if you would, are interested in how the church runs and what we're looking to do over the next, uh, not even just the next 12 months, but the next couple of years, because we're looking at uh, our strategic planning as part of that, then by all means, please come. So thank you. That was um, Colin. That was a great, a great point. So this morning, we are coming to the end of our sermon series from the book of Revelation. If you think about this in terms of your classic story form, we had the climax, we had the great battle and the, the, the final judgment of God two weeks ago when we looked at uh, Revelation chapter 20 and perhaps even before that, Revelation chapter 19. We've got to that point in the story where it's happily ever after. It's the aftermath. But you know what? The, the happily ever after turns out to be pretty good. You could safely say, this is the good stuff. John's vision of life with God in chapters 21 and 22. Now, there is an awful lot happening in these chapters. There is a lot going on. And I'm going to cover a fair bit of ground this morning. But in that, I want you to try and keep in mind two signposts, if you like, two things that we're going to keep hearing about, keep coming back to. And those things are, firstly, the glory of God, which features really heavily in these passages. And, and the second thing is the presence of God, the presence of God with his people. So John has a lot to say about all the blessings that flow from life with God. But the most important thing is that it is life with God. God is present with his people in a way that hasn't been possible since Eden and the fall. This is the end to which Christian faith is directed. Eternal life with God, reigning together in God's eternal kingdom as children of God and co-heirs with Christ. Well, that sounds pretty good to me. Are we ready? Chapter 21 starts, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And this is our starting point. God's new creation. So last time in chapter 20, there was an image of uncreation as earth and heaven fled from the majesty of God's presence. But now John sees a new heaven and a new earth. And in one sense, it's kind of a repeat. It's a fresh version of God's first creation. So again, there is an earth and a heaven, except it's not the same, not quite. You'll realize as we get further into this that there is almost no mention of heaven. Because God's throne isn't in heaven anymore. It's on earth. The spiritual and the physical are united in a new way in this new creation. God and his people no longer separate but together. And that flows through in what we see next of the holy city, the new Jerusalem. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Now this is a really important part of the chapter. And we know that. We know that the holy, city, the holy City figures prominently in all this because John actually comes back to it from the section starting in verse 9. And in verse 10, we hear again, one of the seven angels showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It's almost exactly the same phrase. Now, it doesn't happen twice, but John sees it twice. Safe to say, it's important. And the language here is interesting, or at least, you know, I think it is. By now, most of you know that I'm a language nerd. God's dwelling is a holy city, not a garden. 
There are a lot of ties back to Genesis and to the Garden of Eden in these passages, but the new dwelling of God is a city, not a garden. And this city is described as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband, which is language, language we see used elsewhere in Scripture for the church as the bride of Christ. But that is not the main point of these verses. Listen again. God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. This is covenantal language. God, God's coming to dwell with his people is the ultimate fulfillment of God's covenantal promises of his dwelling with Israel in the temple and the tabernacle, of the new covenant promises of a relationship through the blood of Jesus. This is where it all comes together. And then to finish this part, John quotes again the same verse from Isaiah. It's Isaiah 25, verse 8. And if that sounded familiar, it's because it was. you can also find it in Revelation chapter 7. It's part of the promise of the blessing of heaven here now in eternal life. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. So this is the big deal. This is it. This is the fulfillment of the promises of God and is itself the assurance of ultimate well-being with God. And then we cut away from the holy city for a bit. He who was seated on the throne, and that's God the Father, said, I am making everything new. Everything new. This new creation is just that. God isn't just, you know, sprucing things up, giving the old creation a spring clean and a fresh coat of paint. This is an image of recreation. And that seems appropriate. If you're familiar with the way Paul talks about Christians as people who are made new in Christ, we are a new creation. And this will be a very, very new Everything new creation. And then it says, then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. And we've seen this this sort of formula before. This is God's assurance. And it's coming from God the Father himself that what John records here is trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this. And I will be their God and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And we see here God the Father using the same titles, Alpha and Omega, that Jesus used in Revelation chapter 1. And that language there of the water of life, that comes from Jesus as well. John chapter 4, Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well. He says, I will give you living water, water of life. So this is an interesting statement about the Trinity. Father, Son, and in fact, Holy Spirit as well, because the water of life is often associated with the Holy Spirit. And it's also a really good example of how much the language that John uses in these chapters depends on what's gone before. There's lots of references to Genesis, to John's Gospel, to the earlier passages in Revelation. We've seen some quotes from Isaiah as well. But again, the big thing is the promise of covenant fulfillment. I will be their God and they will be my children. It is an astonishing thing to promise, to declare. But in pronouncing this blessing, God doesn't shy away from the necessity of judgment. All evildoers, all idolaters and liars, and that covers a lot of ground, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The next section from verses 9 to 21 gives us a more complete description of the holy city. So like I said, we're coming back. This is an important image for John. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. 
And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurements and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. Now, I'm not going to try and explain all of that. If I did, it would be at least a full sermon on its own, probably more. But let me pick out two points in particular. In verse 11, we're told, The city shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. The whole city shone with the glory of God. The whole thing. I love that image. And more, its brilliance was like that of Jasper. And again, this is going to be more for the people who've been with us for the whole series. Jasper and Carnelian together were the two gemstones used to represent the glory of God back in Revelation chapter 4. So in John's vision of the heavenly throne room, Jasper and glory. Here now in chapter 21, Jasper and glory. But Jasper is also used for the walls of the city and its first foundation. So the glory of God is the light of the city, but is also its strength and stability. Also in Revelation chapter 4, so again casting our mind back to the heavenly throne room, there are 24 elders representing the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles, Israel and the church, together. And here those tribes and apostles are specifically identified with parts of the city, its gates and its foundations. The whole point is that as in heaven, now on earth, the glory of God. But one thing from chapter 4 is missing. The sea is missing. In fact, the sea is missing in this chapter as well. We're specifically told in verse 1 that the sea is no more. But that sea is something different. The sea in verse 1 is the sea as we know it. The ocean, untamed waves, violent storms. It's a symbol of primeval, uncontrollable chaos, and that has no place in God's ordered creation. But the sea I'm talking about from chapter 4, verse 6, in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. And that sea, probably don't remember, but it represented God's holiness, separating him from everything that's sinful, and it's not there anymore. It's not there because it's not needed. All of this other stuff from chapter 4 gets picked up and put in a new context, but not that. Not that. God is still glorious, but he's no longer kept apart. He's no longer separated from his people. God is still pure, perfect and uncorruptible. But there's a sense in which he's not holy the same way because being holy means being set apart. And we're all holy together. And that's the other point I want to take you to. The holy city is described as a cube. 12,000 stadia in length, width and height. Now in metric terms, I had to work this out. It's about 2,200 kilometres. 
And if you're struggling to visualise that, it's pretty much a straight line run from here to Kununurra, or Adelaide to Darwin, if you prefer. The footprint of God's holy city is 4.8 million square kilometres. It's 1.8 times the size of Western Australia. And it extends to the outer limits of low Earth orbit, 2,200 kilometres up. Now, I don't know whether we're meant to take that literally. It could be. It could just be that I'm struggling to imagine a city that extends that high. On the other hand, 12,000 could be 12 times 10 times 10 times 10, which are numbers we've seen associated before with God's abundant completion. The more important thing, though, is the shape. The city is a perfect cube. Now, what else is a cube in the Bible? Does anyone remember? Anyone know? No one's willing to give it a, a try anyway. The Holy of Holies. In the temple and in the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies is a perfect cube. It is 20 cubits cubed, about 9 or 10 metres long and wide and high. And this is a huge version of that. Except only the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies, and that only once a year. The holy city, though, is big enough for all God's people all the time. Let me say that again. All God's people together, dwelling with God. So all this language of gemstones and pure gold and pearls as big as city gates, that's fine. It's fine. It gives some impression of the tremendous worth, the priceless treasure that the city represents. But you can take it or leave it. Honestly, I'm not even sure what gold as pure as transparent glass looks like, and I don't really care. You know what does matter? God lives there. God dwells there and there is room enough for all God's people, and that's a treasure I can get behind. And John continues, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. More good stuff, more promises of blessing. There is no temple in this city. No temple because there is no need of one. No priesthood either, I suspect, because we no longer need anything or anyone to represent God. God is simply there. And neither is there sun or moon. Again, God is there and God is light. Sun and moon are superfluous, for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp. Again, the glory of God is emphasized. That's one of our signposts, remember, one of our touchstones, the glory of God. And that light is really important here. The gates of the city never close because it is never night. What does that tell you? The glory of God, the light, means that the city, the place of God, is eternally secure, can never be threatened. The gates will never need to close against an invader. God's glory guarantees the eternal security and peace of the city. The glory of God, this light, is also the light by which the nations will walk. All people will be guided by the glory of God. And all people honour God and bring Him tribute. The kings of the earth will bring their splendour into it, and the glory and honour of the nations will be brought into it. Yet for all that, we are reminded that some things, some people, are excluded. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful. Now, I wouldn't take that as indicating any, any kind of further sin or judgment. After all, we've already had the final judgment in chapter 20. All of that's been dealt with. 
to me, I read this as confirmation that everything that remains, everything that is left after God's judgment is perfect, flawless and pure. In chapter 22 then, John writes, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. Here the focus tightens a little from the city, its key features, its walls and foundations to the throne of God, the river that flows from the throne and the tree of life that grows alongside the river. Now, the water of life, again, we've already come to that. We saw that in Revelation chapter 21 and in John chapter 4. The tree of life goes back even further to Genesis chapters 2 and 3. And again, in, all of, in this particular section, there's a lot of callbacks to Eden and Genesis. So in Genesis chapter 2, the tree of life was with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the center of God's garden. But at the end of chapter 3, after the fall, God declares, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Then the tree is off limits. Humanity is cast out of the garden, so they will not take the fruit of this tree. But here, it's readily accessible. It is in the main street of the city. And in fact, the abundance of its crop is emphasized every month it yields its fruit. Even its leaves are for the healing of the nations. So these passages don't just give us an image of God's new creation, of God dwelling with his people. And both of those are ideas that go back to Genesis and Eden. But we have here also the confirmation that the curse of sin is gone. However you want to think about that, it's abolished, reversed, unmade. The curse is gone. Humanity can now eat from the tree of life and live forever. We are specifically told no longer is there any curse. Now, what else do we see from these verses? Well, firstly, God reigns. The throne of God and of the Lamb is mentioned twice. God's people see his face, something that has been impossible since the fall. And they are God's people. They belong to God and have that name on their foreheads. We've seen that in previous chapters as well. And again, we have a repeat of John's description of God as the source of light. The last point that I want to bring out of these verses is this curious bringing together of, on the one hand, being God's servants and serving, and on the other hand, we're told that we will reign forever and ever. Now, I feel like that's something that we struggle with a bit because we tend to see serving as down here and ruling as up here. There's a tension there from a human, a worldly perspective. Now, again, there's a lot more in that that you could say. Just two things quickly. Firstly, the tension is not a real tension. That's just our human perspective. Because remember, Jesus did exactly that. Jesus was and is the king who came to serve. Being a Christian has always been about following that example. So this thing in the eternal life to come There's no tension. It's not even anything new. It's what we have always been called to. And the other thing is to say that this is service without any of the negative connotations. No drudgery, no lower status. And it's ruling without ruling over people because we will all reign together. Finally, in verse 6, we're told... The angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Now, most translations group that verse with the passage that follows. 
not the verses that I've just read. But I wanted to bring it to your attention because that phrase, things that must soon take place, is again, it's an echo of what? Revelation chapter 4, and this time verse 1. Jesus says to John, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. So this section, Revelation chapter 21 and this first part of Revelation chapter 22, are just a superb conclusion to the book of Revelation and to the Bible as a whole because they tie off all the loose ends. A new creation and the undoing of the curse taking us back to Genesis 2 and 3. And from Revelation 4, remember the heavenly throne room, the glory of God, then in heaven, now on earth. Perhaps more than that, though, these chapters are just stuffed full. They are chock-a-block with the promised blessing for God's people. The fulfillment of God's covenant promises, the assurance of ultimate well-being, all of God's people dwelling with God, a city that is established, secured and lit up. It's permeated through with the glory of God. God present with his people in an immediate, visible, you might even say tangible way that surpasses the Garden of Eden. Eternal life with God because sin is completely absent. The curse is gone. There is no longer anything that could disrupt our relationship with God. So many good things that I've run out of space and time. But all of it, all of it, revolves around the fact that God is there. In the holy city, the new Jerusalem, God is there and we will be there with God if we will only hold tight to our faith in Jesus. This is the promise that is ours as Christians. This is the future we live for. The kingdom of God that we are part of and long to enter fully. The kingdom of God we want all people to enter, that they would be saved and not condemned to the lake of fire and the second death. But is all this a future hope? Some dream of the distant future? No. And this is what I want to finish with. Not the end times, end times, because it is the the presence of God that makes John's vision of eternal life worthwhile, and God is present with us now by His Holy Spirit. It is the presence of God that makes eternal life good, And it is the presence of God that makes Christian life now possible. So we talk about this sometimes as the kingdom of God being now and not yet. So sure, God isn't present with us now as he will be then. We can't see God's face or bask in the light of God's glory. But God does reign. He is present. These things are what makes that Christian life possible. So when Jesus says in Matthew's Gospel, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, I think this is what he's driving at. So yes, part of the application today is about future hope. Don't lose sight of the hope that is set before us in Scripture. But what I really want to encourage you to do is to cultivate an awareness of the presence of God. Actively cultivate an awareness of the presence of God. Because God is with us. We have that blessing now, and yet we spend so much of our lives just blissfully unaware. Well, except blissfully is the wrong word. Just flat out unaware for good or bad. And we can make that a choice. And yes, there will be seasons in your life when God seems distant. There will be seasons in your life when everything seems dry and barren and fruitless. When times are hard. But even then, you can cultivate an awareness of the presence of God. 
you can choose to lean into that. Now, how that works will be different for lots of different people. Some people feel God's presence in different ways. If you're an extrovert, you might find that in fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. If you're an introvert, that might be really a struggle for you. Personally, I love worshipping through music and song. I feel something of God's presence as I sing. If you've watched the movie Chariots of Fire, the, the main character there felt the presence of God as he ran. That was his way of cultivating that awareness, that awareness of the presence. For you, it might be going out into nature. There's lots and lots of different ways that might work for you. So what I would encourage you to do is to think about what that looks like for you. And if you don't know, to talk to some Christians you trust about what things are most important to you in your Christian walk. Maybe think about how, how you might do that. So that's a, a conversation I would encourage you to have over morning tea after we finish the service. And in fact, I have a sneaking feeling that I... I um, well, I've been a bit cheeky. I said we're coming to the end of our sermon series on Revelation, but I do feel there's probably one more in the tank. Because I think at some point, this passage has drawn together the threads in the language and the story of Revelation. What I want to do now is to draw together the threads in terms of what does it look like for us living now in light of this future kingdom? But that'll have to wait for another week. So can I encourage you all, hold on to hope, but lean into, look for, seek out the presence of God and help each other with that now as I invite our team to come back up. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you that you are present with us. I thank you that your Holy Spirit is with us even now. Lord, for those people who are struggling with that, who feel uh, just no sense of connection, Lord, would you just shine a little bit of the light of your glory? Help them to know that you are present, that you love them, you cherish them. You are also are looking forward to the day when we can share time in that city together. Lord, strengthen us, I pray. For those of us who are believers, may we not lose sight of the hope that you have set before us. And may we, with all graciousness and wisdom and love, Set that before other people as well, that they would at least hear the hope that we have in Christ. Thank you so much for your presence with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.